Welcome, everybody, to episode 59 of VR Roundtable. My name is Anthony, and of course, this week, I'm joined by Steve. I'm also joined by Chris. We do not have Gary this week, but we do have a special guest. We've got Tech Ninja. Is that how you pronounce it? <laughs> that is correct. Tech Ninja? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Tech Ninja. So, hey, Joe, what's up? How's it going? Good, man. How, how about everybody else? Good. I'm doing good. Yeah, good. Awesome, awesome. Why don't you go ahead and uh, just fill us in on your channel uh, real quick? Because we know you got it. You got your YouTube channel. You're doing a lot of VR stuff yourself, right? Yes, that is correct. I've been going for about seven months now. I started out with, you know, of course, having the Vive, moved on to PlayStation VR, and now I got the Rift as well. I try to do about mm, two to three uploads a week if I can. It's been kind of rough lately, but I do my best for it. Um, but it's been, I mean, it's just been so wonderful having these opportunities to get all these games I otherwise probably couldn't even afford, you know what I mean? And having a chance to really get into like just a lot of the VR stuff that quite frankly, I probably wouldn't have even heard of if, if developers hadn't contacted me. So it's, it's been a pretty amazing ride actually. I imagine it's kind of how it is for you guys too. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, what's awesome is you have all three of the major platforms, and later on in this episode, we might take a quick look at like the state of VR. So it's good to have you aboard on this episode because uh, me and Steve also have all three as well. And so we can kind of get into a discussion about what is the current state of VR right now. But let's get into a couple of news stories. Now, when it comes to news, this is one of the worst weeks I've seen in I don't know how long. I'm doing like this little daily vlog thing myself. And I mean, I had to scrape the bottom of the barrel to try to find news stories. It was just a bad week. But one thing that we're seeing in the news this week, almost maybe too much, is Pimax. Pimax this, Pimax that. I mean, I go to the... the uh, the Vive subreddit every single day, and it's like half of the threads are Pimax. Pimax in Amsterdam, Pimax in New York. Uh, this guy tried Pimax with Project Cars too. This guy didn't, you know? So anyway, why don't we kick it over to Steve? Steve, what is going on with Pimax? Because we are absolutely getting slammed with nothing but Pimax news. Well, you know, what's what, what I think is really happening is is that the Kickstarter is coming to a close. Uh, we're recording this on Sunday this week, so I think there's five days left uh, as of now. So four days by the time you're listening to this uh, when we release the episode tomorrow. So that's some of it. Uh, another part of it is that they're going around and they are uh, basically demoing it. Like you said, they got demos that are semi-open to the public. I Really, I don't have all of the the information there because I didn't really pay attention because none of them are anywhere near my area. So it wasn't really on my radar to pay too close attention to how the demos work. But basically, uh, at least some people, there's a lot of people on Reddit that have been able to, to check these units out and uh, they're on their third prototype. Now they don't have the third prototype everywhere. Uh, so the V2 I think is in Amsterdam, the V3 in New York or something like that. And so basically a lot of people are, are able to get their, their grubby mitts on one. Uh, the Kickstarter's coming to a close. Uh, they exceeded uh, the Oculus Kickstarter in terms of, of dollars. Um, and so we're just getting more and more information. So now my, my expectation is that, you know, over the next few days, as, as the Kickstarter does close, uh, the, the, the hype will probably die down. Uh, and then pick up again as we get closer to to uh, the unit shipping. All right, so why don't we go around the table real quick and and let's talk about who who among us is interested in Pimax? Um, Joe, why don't we kick it over to you? Um, do you have like are you going to be interested in this? Or are you going to play it by ear? What's your strategy with this? A lot of it, I'm thinking, is I mean. The 8K, I'm going to do it like this. The 8K sounds pretty awesome. I know it's going to be a huge difference from what we're used to on Vive and Rift. It is nice to see that there is still interest in virtual reality to where people are still, you know, funding these things, which is outstanding. But I mean, I mean, and the fact that it plays Steam VR is good too. That's awesome. But I think we need more. I mean, I think we're or we're kind of getting to the point now where we need more. Anthony, I've heard you many times say this is like the Intellivision days of virtual reality. That's kind of bringing it maybe closer to Nintendo, maybe, you know what I mean? But I mean, I think it's, I think it's time we worry about the next gen. What do you guys think though? Yeah, so that's, no. 
That's where I'm at. So I went ahead and and backed it. And uh, Gary's not here to speak for himself, but he has also backed it. And we've backed it with this understanding that we have another five days or so to to decide to unback it. So I'm kind of on the fence. Like part of me is like, uh, we'll call it the fear of missing out or whatever. Like this this headset could be the the easily the best one on the market when it's out and i'm i have a concern that okay you know all the the kickstarter backers are going to get theirs in late december january or whatever and then like like i have a concern that the those that didn't back the kickstarter can't pick it up until march april may or something like that so it's 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 not like a rift or or a vive or or a playstation vr where you know you, once it came out you could just go to the store and get one too i mean there were some you know procurement issues but for the most part you could get one uh with the pimax i'm not sure that's going to be the case in january so with that in mind i went ahead and backed it um but i'm still really toying with with whether or not i, I want to keep it um I did want to talk about the the actual um, you know some some the the milestones within the Kickstarter, and that's another reason why I decided to back it uh, for now was because there are a lot of freebies and and some of them I think are a little bit sketchy and and we can touch on it but uh, I'll, I'll just run down them pretty quick. Um, at, at half a million, they gave an additional face cushion, which is pretty straightforward, no big deal. Uh, I would expect them to deliver on that at launch. Uh, at one million, uh, they're now giving out the equivalent of the deluxe audio head strap. I, I forget what they call it exactly, but it's basically the, what the deluxe audio head strap is for the Vive. Uh, that's what this is for the Pimax. At uh, 1.5 million, uh, they're giving away the the little cooling fan attachment, like the Vive and Chill. Again, they're 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 very much copying off a lot of the uh, uh, the HTC Vive and their accessories and stuff in that way. Uh, but they're also doing the prescription lens uh, frame. Uh, I'm pretty sure that won't come with any lenses. You have to procure your own lenses, but they're at least giving the the frame away. And that was a big deal for me because as I look at like the V3 prototype, they they have a video up on the YouTube channel. The the lenses are like pretty like when you put this on your your the lenses are right there that's i guess one of the way that they're able to get the fove it's not like the vibe or the rift where you have a have an air gap like it seems like these lenses are the closest to your eyeballs you know with the headset on so as a glasses wear i'm very concerned about that um and then at two million they are doing a hundred dollar coupon off of the wireless transmitter as far as i know we haven't seen anything on this transmitter and we know that tp cast has issues and and it's not easy uh so i really question how soon or how the pimax's wireless ability may or may not work given that that it's more bandwidth needed to transmit the the additional resolution um at two and a half million, uh, it just has three pieces of selected content. So it's going to be three games or three apps or three somethings. Uh, and then they just passed three million, I believe, today. Uh, and it's their the giveaway is a free eye tracking module. We haven't seen anything on that. My guess is that that will ship way later. Uh, maybe it's not a big deal. Maybe it ends up being a big deal. Uh, you know, it, it's free for if I choose to keep it. So um, they're at this point, they're running out of things to give away. Like, <laughs> next no, thing, Steve, you know, you free, know what? free cat, free puppy. Like, I mean, what are they going <laughs> to give away? <laughs> if it hits four million, you get Magic Leap. You get a Magic Leap thrown in when it hits four mil. <laughs> in, that, in that case, I'm definitely keeping it uh, <laughs> because you know I want to be one of the few people to get see Magic Leap. So anyway, so it's it's a very interesting product, but I have some concerns, and and I'm sure you guys have similar concerns whether or not you intend to back it. Um, and you know what? I'm not going to jump into that. I'll, I'll kick it to you, Anthony. What what are your thoughts on on all this? Do you have any concerns? Well, yeah, you know, I do have a concern. Here's my concern. I feel bad for anyone that it, that had plans to bring out a new headset early in 2018. Like, for example, LG, right? Okay, so LG has this Steam VR headset. We thought it was coming this year. Doesn't appear like it's coming this year, but it's probably going to come early in 2018, you'd think. And for anybody that's selling a headset, 
what they're going to sell it to is these early adopter types that do want to upgrade. They want to get a marginal upgrade. Even if it's not a huge upgrade, they want to upgrade. And now you have $3 million of early adopter money that has been siphoned off into this one area over here. That money is gone money. That money doesn't exist anymore. So LG, anybody else that's, that's selling a headset early next year that they're going to launch one, there goes your early adopter market right there. Now, of course, the LG isn't going to be a K and all of that. So who knows if how that correlates. But for me, I mean, I look at all this Pimax stuff. It's interesting. I mean, I see the appeal, obviously, but I'm willing to def. I'm surprised. I'm really surprised that Steve and Gary both jumped on this Kickstarter. Um, me, I'm going to watch it from the sidelines. My take is... If I knew for sure that I was getting the legit 2.0 uh, uh, lighthouses and getting knuckles, like actual legit knuckles, if I knew if it if I knew it came with legit knuckles, the absolute real legit lighthouses, that would change the uh, overall scenario for me. But the the last thing I saw on the controllers is it looked like they were making basically like a knuckles knockoff to make it kind of seem like knuckles, but it's not really knuckles. So what controller are you getting? I mean, I know that's if you're just trying to get the headset by itself and you're just going to add the headset, you're going to use your Vive wands and you'll worry about knuckles later. That's obviously a different different ball game. But Chris, why don't I go to you real quick? Is there any worry at all with all this money going to Pimax that whoever wants to launch a headset early next year is going to not have a great market to sell to right away? Yeah, I could see that, um, like especially the LG example you gave, because, I mean, people are kind of going to be expecting more resolution, more field of view. People are going to be just expecting it. They're like, hey, this Chinese company did it. Why couldn't LG do it or something like that? Um, yeah, I, I haven't backed this, and the only reason is because I'm scared of Kickstarters now, ever since my STEM system still hasn't shipped yet. It's been years. I'm waiting for my STEM system. But, um, I mean, Pimax seems like a fairly reputable company, but I guess you just never know. Like, every Kickstarter seems to be delayed a little bit, so I'm a little worried about that. But also, like, what's the price of these units when they're in retail are they going to have like a ridiculous discount because i mean that would maybe that's pretty from, enticing I don't, I don't think they've stated uh but from what i've read pimax has said they're they're basically through the kickstarter selling them at cost so they're they're this is a, as an opportunity for them to get production up and going and get sort of the economies of scale set and then whatever price they may ch charge down the line you know is is um, so the 8K is five, 499 on the Kickstarter, not counting those that got the very early bird stuff, but it's 499. So is this a 699, 799 headset once it goes into retail? You know, I, I would say somewhere around there. Uh, it's positioning itself to be the the high end. Um, so you know, and it, it kind of is what it is. It's one of those things like if if Oculus or HTC or Sony. Uh, or LG or Samsung, if they were saying, hey, we're, we're coming out with this 200 degree field of view, uh, higher resolution headset compatible with lighthouse tracking, like none of us would bat an eye, right? right. Like they'd be like, okay, right on, let's go. You know, I want to buy one right now. Yeah. So so the, 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 the issue is that it's this Pimax company and they, they have the Pimax 4K that came out, I guess, last year and, and I've never tried one. Um, from, so from a Kickstarter perspective, at least there is some comfort there that the company is actually manufactured and sold something. And I don't remember, I don't recall seeing a, a long laundry list of, of uh, you know, people unhappy with the product or a long laundry list of quality issues, which naturally comes up, you know, in, in and I don't mean this just because they're, you know, a Chinese manufacturer, uh, but, but there is that sort of stigma that comes with Chinese products. And and you know quality, especially couple that with uh, the fact that they're throwing in everything in, in, in the 
under the sun as a as a freebies or or the fact that they've done any kind of development with so much stuff it almost makes you wonder are they just saying yes are they yes men are they saying yes to everything oh well we can do that oh we can make the little little fan module that you clip <laughs> on the top oh we can do foveated render and oh we yes we can do we can do anything you know and so if they can if they truly can then then why hasn't oculus done it why hasn't sony does it does it why why, why hasn't everyone else done it and so that's what makes me sort of optimistic and, and why I'm not a hundred percent sure I'm going to keep my back, uh, my back of the, of the Kickstarter. So, um, I'm going to keep this back. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's, you know, it's, 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 it's a hard decision. Normally I don't suffer from, from these sorts of, uh, conundrums when it comes to buying a new toy. Usually I want a new toy. I justify it or I don't. And, and, and I go out and buy it, but this, I'm really like flip-flopping like 50, 50 on whether or not I want to keep it. Yeah. I mean, the thing is like, if, I don't know. I feel like I just need some other company to acknowledge that this is legit. Like, like if Valve came out and said, like, oh, we're going to add support for the Pimax directly. We're going to, like, fix the FOV warping issues that they've been having within Steam VR. Like, I don't know. Like, the Oculus Kickstarter seemed so good because they had Epic Games. They had um, Gabe Newell on their Kickstarter video. You know, they had people in the industry that were all saying they're going to support and work with Oculus. So, like... I feel like if I saw Gabe Newell or I saw any of these these higher up people like saying that they're going to work with Pimax, that would just kind of amplify how much I trust the company. But I, I see where you're coming from. Like, I mean, I don't want to miss out either. If it turns out to be amazing, I'm going to be bummed. But I don't know. So, but it's it's catch twenty two if it does turn out to be amazing, right? So, like, let's say this. So, there's a lot of firsthand accounts on Reddit. You know, first of all, off and and most people largely come away with it positive. They have some you know things they'd like to see fixed. Uh, lately, you know, there's some concerns that the demo units are running at 75 hertz instead of 90 hertz. Um, so so there are some concerns, but largely most people come away saying, okay, this is this is a big improvement. This is a game changer. So for a moment, let's pretend that's true. Like that that. Pimax delivers on everything they've said, and it's not a, a a cheap piece of plastic junk. Then. Then what does that mean for for Rift, for me as an owner of a Rift and and a Vive and a PlayStation VR? Like like, am I going to be able to put my Rift on and want to play with the thing, you know, and come back down to the 110 degree or whatever fove? Like like that's that's a that's a legitimate concern that I have because you know we all stepped away from flat gaming because the feeling wasn't there anymore. So like if I get this Pimax and and it does deliver on what it says, then am I gonna like not want to play my Rift or PlayStation? Because right now, yeah, the PlayStation has a little bit less fove than the Rift. The Rift has a little bit less fove than the Vive, but it's not such a magnitude difference that that it you know really really changes this the, the game at 200 degree fove and at a higher resolution and at at uh less uh god rays less lens flare which are all things people are reporting that that's working now in the prototypes like that could make me not want to play my other headsets so that's that's really my biggest concern other than than it, them just not being able to deliver you know one concern i have though is just to go back to the name pimax like this company. Okay, so if you go to Walmart, right, they have 4K TVs that are made by this company called Hisense. Has anybody ever seen that? And like these, like they'll have a 4K TV that has this, that, and the other thing, and it's half the price of any normal 4K TV, even like the Costco 4K TVs. It's half the price of that. And I always just wonder, like, how is this possible? You know, how are they able to do that? And is it just incredibly shoddy man manufacturing and it's going to like have problems and stuff? Didn't Pimax like they had a headset already? Didn't people have some problems with that headset too? I thought I remember hearing people complaining about something about that headset, but I don't really remember what it was. But and then the other thing that um, Chris mentioned was wait a minute. I now I completely forgot what he mentioned. But anyway, um, what we can do is we can go with, I mean, we're almost in the state of VR discussion anyway. So do you want to just move on into that? Sure. Yeah. So what we thought, because we don't really have many news stories, like the Pimax news story is pretty much the only major news story we have. So we thought we might go into a quick like state of VR discussion. And this Pimax is kind of bringing that on because all of us are considering 
what do we do with all these headsets? So, Joe, you've got three different headsets right now. You got that PSVR headset. You got the Rift. You got the Vive. Are you going to just, I mean, when, when you look at the overall VR market, do you feel like all three of them have their value there? And and are you looking to add another one? Are you looking to sell any of them? What What's your thought? I mean, they all have their strengths. Of course, Rift's strength is probably going to be its exclusivity, which is pretty much forced. But you can kind of get over that with Revival. And of course, those of us that use Revive know it's not always perfect. And that's kind of why I ran out and just bought the Rift when they went on sale sale um i don't think i'm gonna <laughs> sell them yeah i don't think i'm gonna sell it anytime soon what i am concerned with just to kind of go off just a little bit is back to the pimax is i'm afraid of putting out that money to get the pimax only to find that hcc is like hey you know what here's the vibe too and it's got everything that the pimax has and more and the backing of hcc y- you know what i mean so i'm kind of worried about that too i guess when it's time to upgrade to like the next vibe or the next thrift i will do that but for the three I've got, I think they're absolutely fine for what I need. I mean, other than the, like you said, the field of view is maybe a small annoyance. Screen door effects, it's been a year. I've learned to live with it. You, you know what I mean? So I, I, I what think. What is it like um, yeah. as, as a PSVR owner and then also having like the two high end PC VR headsets? How, how does the PlayStation VR compare as far as you're concerned? Like you still play it occasionally, right? I do. I do. My main concern or p- my main issue with PlayStation VR is still the camera. It's a single camera setup. If there was one behind you, I think they could actually find a way to make this a lot better. It's just so very limiting. Like I'm playing super hot and every so often my my gun just flies away. It's gone and it drives me insane. And that's not even the only game it does it in. You know, my my uh, Vive, of course, I've got the room scale. I've got the same thing with the Rifts, although since it's not cordless, it is. I mean, look at that cord all the way back there. It's horrible. Um, as far as quality goes, I mean, PlayStation's starting to get more and more exclusives because it's Sony. So, I mean, that, And that's one of the main reasons I've kept my PlayStation VR is because there are some awesome things coming for it. Megaton Rainfall being one of them. I thought that was pretty pretty awesome, actually. You know, so the, like, like I, I mean, I'm going to keep saying that they all have their strengths. They just all have the strengths. So yeah. like, but going forward, like, if, like looking towards next year. So you're, as far as you're concerned, you're just going to kind of stay with what you have and just see what's going on. But you don't have any like specific plans for a new headset next year or anything like that. You're just going to ride the tide. Absolutely. I mean, nothing's been announced yet. So no, I have no plans for one yet. I mean, uh, the LG, but. I don't know what it's going to, I was going to be much better than what I have. So I, I don't, I mean, I just don't see it. I mean, I think what we have right now is fine for what okay, it is. Okay. Why don't we go, um, let's, let's shoot it over to Chris. Chris, I know you're kind of the Oculus guy. You've kind of had a little bit of brand loyalty towards the Oculus. That's all right. You know, some of us have that brand loyalty, some of us don't. But um, what's your thought? Like, is as an Oculus, fan to a degree do do you think oculus is going to react to pimax and and new headsets and stuff or or do you think when 2018 2018 is going to come and go and we're not going to see a a cv2 i mean i don't know based on what oculus has said like at the oculus connect 4 and everything it seems like there's no new pc vr headset for a while at least a few years um they're really trying to focus on content, and I feel like that does make sense because, like, at some point, all these headsets are good enough that all the content is really what's lacking, it feels like. Like, you know, the controllers are good enough, and, like, the headsets are good enough to get some really cool experiences out there, but developers don't really have those experiences out yet, or they're still working on them. So I think that's really the main thing. Um I don't really see the need to have a Vive and a Rift. Like, the more I, I have them both, I'm like, if I have a Rift, I can play most Steam VR games almost identically to the Vive. And I'm just like, I don't know. Like, maybe I should only have a Rift. But at the same time, I do like having the larger play space. So I, I keep going back and forth on that. But um, I did want to bring up one thing that uh, Joe brought up kind of about, or and you, Anthony, brought up about Pimax. Um, if they have access to these screens and stuff, you know that means they're being manufactured by somebody and that, you know, like sometimes there's a consumer headset and then a ripoff Chinese one 
that uses the same components. So I'm like wondering if there's like some company that's actually more legit using these same components that the Pimax is. Like that's possible because there's a lot of money going into all this stuff that the Pimax has, I'm sure. I don't know if they're spending all of it developing the screens and all that. So I don't know. Do you guys want to talk about that? That just seemed interesting to me to think it's about. a good point. Well, I think they've said that they worked with the manufacturer on the screens because it's a it's a LCD, and and I would hope that Oculus and and HTC and LG and Samsung would kind of continue down the OLED path and not really dip towards the LCD. I know the a lot of the Windows MR units used LCD, uh, and honestly, when I had the Dell, which by the way, to all of our listeners, uh, I did return it. Uh, it just wasn't good enough for me. Sad. Uh, Yep. (laughs) But, uh, you know, when having when I had that that headset, like I didn't really, you know, I had it for the week or whatever. So I I, but during that time, I didn't really feel like, okay, well, this is an LCD and it feels inferior or anything like that. You know, all else being equal, I think we'd all prefer OLED uh, opposed to LCD. Um, So I'm going to go ahead and send it back to Anthony since I'm maybe having issues. Uh, No, you're you're okay. It was just for a second there. Um, Yeah. So. I don't know. I mean, just thinking about the state of VR, like when I think of the three platforms, first of all, I'll say PlayStation VR. We've had PlayStation VR now for a year and I've been impressed, man, what Sony has delivered. I mean, everybody will talk that the number one thing people complain about with PlayStation VR is the move controllers. And and you and like Joe brought up the fact there's one camera. And the, the thing about the one camera thing is you would say, oh, just add a second camera. The problem is if you're a console manufacturer, you have to be very cognizant of living rooms, of grandma, of the dog, of the cat, little kids crawling on the rugs. So if there's another camera, it's got to be wireless in some way because if you that they need to come up with a solution that is more lighthouse like for PlayStation VR 2. So I don't think we're going to see any improvement there. And most people talk about the Move controllers. They want new sticks. And I always say, look, at just relax, relax. We we have the Solus Project. I don't know if you tried that, Joe. The Solus Project on PlayStation VR, mm-hmm. it actually uses a mode where you can kind of do like free locomotion with and use two Move controllers at the same time. But it's it's kind of hamstrung. But But I'm still amazed at what the PlayStation VR has been able to bring. You know, one thing I haven't mentioned on VR Roundtable at all is I got to try raw data for the PlayStation VR, the raw data port. And I was blown away by how good that port was. Now, I'm playing it on PlayStation 4 Pro, but when I was in there playing raw data and and in the game, there were times when I just completely forgot that I was on PlayStation VR. It felt like I was playing on my Vive or something. And that is incredible for somebody that doesn't want to spend a ton of money on the Vive and a, and a PC and all that to be able to get into VR. So PSVR is doing well. I think we'll probably get a new one like November 2019 probably. And as far as Vive and, and Oculus, I mean, Chris was saying that we're not going to get a new Oculus headset next year, probably not even an a- announcement. But I think HTC... Like, when do you guys think we're going to hear something from HTC? Because you do have these new lighthouses and you do have the knuckles. And Valve is eventually, the new lighthouses are going to be coming to some kind of headset. That has to happen, right? So, Steve, I mean, do you think HTC might have some announcement earlier in the year next year? Do you think it's another year away? Well, at this point, Pimax is going to have knuckles out, their version of the knuckles out before Valve gets the real knuckles out. <laughs> I mean, they just Pimax seemed to move a lot faster. HTC, so like going back to the whole concept of the state of, of VR and, and where we are right now, you know, year and a half in, um, I think both HTC and Oculus are focused on the whole portable mobile uh, that they they seem to really want to steer it in that direction. All the focus at, at, at Oculus Connect for this year was was on the Oculus Go, which is a product I'm interested in. Uh, I was also on the uh, you know they showed the the updates they've made to Santa Cruz over the last year. HTC has announced what, what they call it, the Focus or whatever their their sort of Santa Cruz, I guess somewhere between the Go and the Santa Cruz. Um, so I, I'm partially concerned, not I shouldn't say concerned, but I'm partially thinking that that the 
those those headset makers are wanting to go that direction. Like they they want to kind of steer it away from the tethered, high end, connected to a PC experience. Um, you know, and, 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 I, and it's purely speculation. It just seems to be that's what their focus is right now. Now, I think they, you know, I'm pretty sure HTC is going to make a Vive 2. I'm pretty sure that Oculus is going to make a, a, a successor to the Rift. I don't know if they call it the Rift. Um, so, so yes, that's that's in the wheelhouse. That's in their, their development, I'm sure. But right now, over the next 12 to 18 months, I would not be surprised if the 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 larger focus from both of those organizations are are the portable mobile wireless uh, headset solutions that they're talking about now. So that kind of opens it up. Sony is over kind of on its own uh, in the console space. Uh, they've done, like you said, I think Sony has done an incredible job. I really like my PlayStation VR. Uh, had I only had a PlayStation VR, I in in you know stayed because before getting a vive uh i was really only a, a console gamer and i know i've said this numerous times over the show and like sony has done really well with the hardware given and at the low price point and and i i, I hate it when i'm on reddit and i see uh you know uh someone with a rift or someone with a vive that just kind of have their noses in the air when it comes to playstation vr and they they kind of talk down on it and say well playstation vr that's not a good vr experience that's a crappy vr experience and it's like no, like the PlayStation VR does a lot of things right that your headset doesn't, you know, and tracking isn't one of them for sure. But 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 when it comes to no God rays, you know, when it comes to no screen door, when it comes to a, a, a very polished software lineup, like comfort, like there's a lot of things that the PlayStation uh, VR does right. And and I really tip my hat to Sony and, and I will keep playing my PlayStation VR, hopefully, assuming I don't get a Pimax and the 200 degree Fove just kind of wipes out my interest. Uh, uh, so kick it to someone You know, else. wait, Steve, one thing, one thing that you brought up there that was very interesting is you talked about this shift that's going to happen to these more mobile devices, right? Yeah. So what does that mean for us? We're PC gamer. Well, I mean, we're VR gamers and we want more stuff like the Talos principle. We want more stuff like heart of the Ember stone. If everything is shifting to this like low end, hardware that can't run those kinds of experiences do you i mean with that comment do you think the vr bubble has kind of burst a little bit are we going to have to scale back because it's weird because right now october we've been absolutely slammed with incredible vr games we got a ton of great games that are coming in november we got fallout and doom and all of that it seems like vr is heating up if anything but is it just timing that we're getting these games now and has the vr hype bubble has it burst why don't i go over to chris chris do you think that this shift to mobile is a sign that the the high-end bubble is burst I think a little bit. Um, I, I take a bunch of production classes. I'm I'm going to college to be a game production manager. So like I, I don't know, manage the teams that make games or whatever. And I mean, there's a big focus on uh, how much users there can be. And I just feel like the PC VR space isn't scaling as much as people wanted it to. Maybe so Oculus kind of pivoted to trying to get this widespread adoption so suddenly developers, if they're working for Oculus Go and Gear VR, can sell way more units than they ever would be able to on the Rift or Vive platforms. So in, in just a pure monetary way, I think mobile has a lot more money possible to it. So developers working in the VR space right now might not get as much money as those that just want to jump in and do some mobile stuff. But I think we're going to see a convergence in a few years. Like once Santa Cruz comes out, maybe the next version of Santa Cruz, we're going to start getting towards like the same level of stuff we have now, but in the mobile space. So, I mean, that's not happening right away. We really need to have this conversion of a standalone wireless, I don't know, basically a Santa Cruz that's cheap. Like once we have that, we can still have these great games that we have now, but also in the mobile side. So it's a weird place to be in for sure. Like, I don't know. This year's going to be really interesting. I don't really know what to expect from it. Joe, what about you? Like when you think about 
the onslaught of AAA VR stuff that we're starting to get. L.A. Noir, we're, we're from other suns. We got Payday 2. This is all coming like mid-November. We got Fallout 4. We got Doom VFR. There's a lot of other big games that are coming. Is this just a side effect of, of all these um, productions that were already in development and then we're going to see a fall off or do you think things are going to continue? Because look at Oculus, you know, they're pumping money into stuff like killing floor excursion, the mages tale lone echo. We know we have the Marvel, uh, Marvel superheroes, whatever Marvel, what is it? Powers United VR, Marvel powers United VR mm-hmm. is going to be coming. Um, there's some additional Lone Echo DLC that's coming. But do you think Oculus is going to continue to pump money in here? Or next year, are we going to be looking at possible game droughts? Or or are this, is it sunny or is it going to be overcast? You know, what's the future for VR? It's, it's going to depend on how these next few months go. If people, we, I mean, we already know everyone's going to pretty much jump into Fallout. That's going to happen. doesn't matter who you are. It's going to happen. Um, same thing with Doom. The other games you mentioned as well. I mean, they're all big, big games, very highly anticipated. But it, the main thing that the industry as a whole, I think, is looking at is they're trying to move it forward to mainstream. That's what they were trying to do in 2016. They didn't do it. They tried to do it this year. They didn't do it. So I honestly do kind of agree with Steve, actually, in that they are probably going to start going more toward the mobile to make it a little more not so high end, more accessible to the average consumer. So that way this can start going, you know, mainstream. That's the that's that's the goal of these companies. Facebook did not buy Oculus for two billion dollars to have a niche product. I'm sure everybody can agree on that. Yep. You know what I mean? So I mean, but it's it's all gonna depend on how these next few months go. As far as your first question though, I do I actually do I actually do think this is stuff that's already been in development. They were hoping that, you know, this month that, that um, sorry, that 2017 was going to pick up enough to where, you know, everybody was going to be buying VR. So they made these big games. Here they are. Thank God for us because we get to actually play them. So hopefully other people can jump in on the bandwagon as well. The nice thing about the rift drop in prices, it is a little bit more accessible. It's accessible, I'm sorry, if you have a high end PC. If you don't have it, it's not accessible. And that's the problem the industry as a whole is going to keep running into. You know what? I'm not going to spend $800 on, or $600 on, on a video card when I can just run out, buy a PlayStation, buy a PlayStation VR. But then eh, I really don't need to do that either. It all goes based on the mainstream. That's, my, that's just my opinion. No, I think, I think you're very that's, – that's very true. And, and we can be sort of misguided at times with our thoughts because we're such fans of this stuff. And, you know, if you really catch, you know, if you were to stand outside of a GameStop or something and, and catch the Call of Duty guy and, and you know, say, hey, you know, are you interested in this this Oculus Rift? And it's only three ninety nine, which which is good. I, I'm very happy Oculus did that. Uh, the price coming down is always a good thing. But but if you were to catch that person and say, you know, will you, will you quit playing Call of Duty on your Xbox or or augment your Call of Duty on, on your Xbox and, and go buy this this? nvidia gtx 1080 and and put it in and start using steam and and just deal with all the extra things that the pc gaming brings to to play with a rift and and no and prior to to vr ever you know becoming this consumer product that it did last year god i'm probably saying something that 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 i may be a little off base on because i don't have any data in front of me so so take that with the caveat that it is but i have the feeling that console gaming sort of steered the market right like pc gaming was a niche and mostly niche thing compared to console gaming and that that you know if if i were making the battlefield you know i was doing so targeting you know the xbox and the playstation platforms and i ported it to pc or or, you know i made it available to pc and the pc version always looked better because it had more horsepower to throw at it but but as a developer and as a publisher i made my money you know going after the consoles well, here's, and I think that's you go, go ahead. Yeah, okay. Um, it's funny just because, like, in my class, we're going over uh, these product segments or whatever, and you know, PC is shrinking year over year by like two percent or so of market share. Um, I mean, I don't have the specific statistics. That's pre- I'm pretty positive about that. 
Um, consoles are staying pretty steady, but then mobile is drastically increasing. Mobile's around like 60% of total game revenue now. Like, you know, if you're making a game and you want money, you're going towards mobile. So I just wanted to bring that up. So like, I think you're definitely right. Like PC gaming is more becoming a niche. Mobile's starting to get bigger. Consoles are kind of the same for now, but yeah, everything's yeah, moving like, towards that. When, when, when I think of the word gamer, like if I said, hey, you know, Chris, are you a gamer? And you say, yeah, I'm thinking that you're playing on a console or on a PC. I do not think you're playing on a tablet when you say the word gamer. But in reality, a lot of younger kids nowadays, when they say, oh, I'm a gamer, it means that they're playing Pokemon or whatever on their iPad. Like, you know, and, and that's why Nintendo, as much as I'm not a particular fan of the product, but that's look what the, what, what the direction they went in with the Switch that's exactly what they're aiming for. They're trying to bleed into that mobile territory. So I think PC gaming and then PC tethered VR gaming, I think it is a very limited market. As much as that's the the, the experience that I want because it gives me the best graphics and the Steve. best frame rate and the best everything. Go ahead. Okay, so Steve, you were talking about this Call of Duty gamer, right? That's outside of GameStop. And, and you were saying that that person's awareness of VR and that person's motivation to maybe get VR is incredibly low. That They're just not interested. I have two teenage boys that don't really care that much about VR. And I, you know, I put them in certain VR things and they'll be like, yeah, that's cool. But they don't want to use it repeatedly over and over again. And the question is... Is there one game, if, is there one game that if it was just done so right in VR, it could change everything? Is is that even possible? I'm going to send it over to Chris. Oh, boy. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I think Lone okay, Echo... If you want to pass, you can no, send can... it over to Joe. <laughs> I, I'll say a little bit, then I'll pass it over to Joe. Um, I think Lone Echo was kind of like the first glisten of that future of that possibility that there's going to be one game that blows everyone's mind i think if lone echo maybe was more interactive and like you know maybe it had a a triple a developer behind it and was you know some ip Ooh, that's that people a sick know. burn bro that's a sick burn no i like a triple a developer <laughs> I, I love it but i love the game i'm just saying if some big developer made something similar but it was with their ip that people know like if it was a call of duty of some kind or something like that would and it's mostly name recognition at this point that really would make people want to try it i guess i don't know what do you think joe <laughs> it's hard to say um the big thing I would say is the risk is just too darn great for anything huge to just – I mean, we're not going to see Grand Theft Auto. It's not going that's, to happen. That's the one I was thinking of. That's the one. See, I honestly think if you could put an incredible Grand Theft Auto in VR where you can really open up car doors, you can you have so much interaction, almost like a job simulator interaction, but you're also in Grand Theft Auto and it's smooth and it's fast – uh, and it's online and it's multiplayer, my kids would probably get freaking hooked on that. Absolutely. Absolutely. But that's just it, though. We're not going to get it. I mean, we have Ellie Noir coming, like you said. It's not the full Ellie Noir. It's going to be missions. It's going to be missions of a game that came out, what, six, probably seven years ago. I'm not even 100% sure on that. They're, they're not going to throw the money into it that it takes because we're not there yet. And it sucks, but we're just not. Yeah. Steve, what say you? I kind of agree with with Joe. Um, I, I don't know. Maybe I'm just kind of in a in a um, not very optimistic mood today with it. But it's like I don't. I'm not convinced that it's going to make this big big sweep. Now I think I think VR can can take over. Uh, you know, for a lot of of niche people and that that have an interest in very very high end, very specific experiences, but. I don't I don't see there being an app that wins over like one game that wins over everyone or, right. uh, you know, is a system seller, so to speak. Like Fallout may be the first real attempt at that. And and I think it will sell some units. Uh, but I don't at this point right now, I don't know what it's going to take for 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 me to be able to walk down my street and choose five houses at random and for there to be at least a 50 60 percent chance that of those houses i selected of having a vr headset in it that isn't a gear vr given to them with a cell phone purchase right 
right? Like, I don't know what it's going to take to get there. And right you know now, it's funny play- though. Go I ahead. was just going to say the Fallout 4 thing that you're mentioning. If we had this discussion a year ago, we would all said, yeah, Fallout 4 is going to save it. It's going <laughs> to save us. And now we know it's not. Yeah. Well, don't feel bad about knowing the answer because guess what? There are multi billion dollar corporations that also don't have the answer. So. No, that's true. Because you know, yeah, if if uh, HTC knew it, they they would be bringing it out. So, but that that doesn't mean that it can't be successful within a within a box, right? Like, and and I think that that's where we are. Like, um, it may not reach you know the gaming in VR. Now, I think VR as a technology is going to be successful because I think it's going to foster just it's going to blur this line. The line already can be blurred with AR uh, or MR. Microsoft's doing a damn good job of blurring the line, <laughs> <laughs> pun notwithstanding. But but like I, I think like when you come into this sort of of uh, you know um, being able to project things into someone's eyes in in you know binocular vision and and or stereoscopic vision like i think that just will open up whether it's vr if you want to say it that way or ar or, or whatever it is like i think that is opening the door with all sorts of interesting ideas so i think the technology is here to stay i think the technology is is useful uh, i think someone's going to find a way to make uh, tools out of it, so to speak, that, that uh, you know, help surgeons. And I know all this stuff is already underway, but the, the, the healthcare industry is eventually going to find use for it. And and so, so as a technology, and the porno too, industry loves it very much. We know what. Ironically, they they are struggling, right? Like, really? Like, <laughs> like normally, like with with DVD, like porn helped, with Blu-ray, porn helped, but like with VR, like no one wants a, a low quality 360 video of a of a naked chick that's you know 15 foot tall and with John, you know because <laughs> yeah. the the scale is all out of whack. Subgenre right there. Huh? I, I, <laughs> I don't know from from personal experience. I've only read that that's how it is. Um, all of us, yeah, none <laughs> of us know. Yeah. So like, you know what? But one thing I was going to say, guys, is so we're thinking about a a game experience, right? Like one game experience. But what about a non-game experience, could it be possible that a killer app could be something like what we got this week from Oculus and Mag- Magnopus, I guess is their name. It's Blade Runner 2049 Memory Lab. I don't know if you guys um, knew about this one, but it came out last week for the Oculus Rift. And certain VR experiences like this could possibly get more and more mass market people interested in. Maybe they could have uh, demos of this at like movie theaters and stuff like that. Chris, did you get a chance to try the the Blade Runner twenty forty nine? Why don't we go ahead and transition into experiences and games and go ahead and kick that off? Yeah, sure. I I did. Um, I also saw the movie. It was all right. I don't know. Uh, no spoilers, but I just the ending bugged me a lot. But it's fine. <laughs> I liked the game a lot. It actually used um, photogrammetry on the people, which was really cool to see. I think that's like the first thing I've seen that has animated pho- photogrammetry of, of people. Uh, so there's real people, real actors in there. I had a bunch of performance issues cause I'm on a, I had it on a hard drive. I think you definitely need it on an SSD or something. Cause like the p- movement was stuttery and it was, it was kind of bad, but uh, it's, it's a really good taste of what storytelling could be like uh, with these people that are scanned in. Like it was really compelling for sure. Uh, in the game, you just kind of, you go into a memory just like you do in the Blade Runner movie and you have to uh, get rid of all the clues that the memory happened or whatever. Like you, you go hunting for different uh, things like cameras and you got to wipe the cameras, all this stuff. Uh, it certainly is a good demo. I think a lot of people would like it, especially after seeing the movie. But uh, yet again, it feels like it's been undercut by the movie. If I had the actors in the movie in this, I'd love it 2,000 times more than I do right now. Um, Because you kind of see some guy who's in the movie, but he's not scanned. It's just like a black face and like there's nothing. I mean, he's in a shadow. Like it might be his voice or whatever, but like I really need the real movie experience in VR. So I think it's a really good taste of what's possible. And like I hope more movies do this type of thing, especially the Ready Player One movie. They better get something really cool out. I don't know. Um, I think we all tried this. So, uh, yeah, Joe, what do you think about it? I thought it was pretty neat. Um, I haven't seen the movie, so I, 
you know, I'm not as familiar, as familiar with it as you were, but I mean, I thought it was definitely neat. I, I'd like to see a lot more things, a lot more different properties actually kind of, kind of go this way. Like, I don't know if you guys did the it, uh, experience or not. It was neat, but it was just basically a 360 video. This was actually pretty nice. So yeah, no, yeah. no, it was the, Steve? it's the best like movie tie in type experience. So we yeah. had, you had it, you had, um, the, what was it, uh, and the ghost in the shell ghost in the shell yeah mm-hmm. that was the one i was thinking of um and and you know most of them are just kind of 3d crappy video and so this was actually like a rendered experience like it was made by by like seemingly by a game developer um and the photogrammity as chris mentioned was 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 cool because i also hadn't seen it on a person in motion now if you got like the the first chick that you see in the beginning like if you get closer to her you could see where like there was some stitching issues like her elbow or whatever was kind of like tethered to her side in this kind of weird way uh but still the tech that's that was very interesting like to see it pulled off that way and to know that this was an actual human actor that that's playing this role as opposed to you know being a programmed uh like the girl in artigo one or whatever so it's all it's all pretty cool. Uh, I didn't finish the experience, but but for a free demo experience, I just have so many other games to play. Um, for a free experience, it's worth everyone checking out. Like yeah. it's it's hard to say you're wasting your time, you know, um, or anything. Like it's, it's certainly worth doing. Like if it was cost money, I'd probably pass on it. Um, but but for free, price is good. You know what, though? I'm telling you, if this thing came out in April of 2016 when VR first started, this could have been like a 1999 thing. And and probably a lot of people wouldn't even have blinked an eye because we had so many really short VR experiences. And there is some interesting things that are going on here. Like when it first starts and you have that lady standing right there and she's talking to you at when it first began, I thought wow, this is like full motion video. This almost looks like a real person here. But but Chris is right. It's like photogrammetry and it's the animation. And I'm wondering when, you know, we have L.A. Noir that's going to be coming November 14th, I believe. It might be kind of similar to this. And The Invisible Hours is kind of similar to this as well. But the cool thing that I'm seeing with this type of stuff is I think we're getting tiny glimpses of the future of storytelling, like how, how you can possibly tell stories and see things act out when you're doing that detective work, we can't, you know, we're not going to spoil this, but, um, the gameplay that you, you get in this is very similar to Quinero and like Batman Arkham VR. And you're doing kind of this detective work and kind of rewinding and looking at stuff and what they can do in a lot of different experiences with this is really interesting. And then, The coolest thing probably of the whole thing is you get to be on the ground floor level of like Times Square in New York, Tokyo or whatever. I don't like in the Blade Runner world. I don't know what city it is. It's like a a mixture of New York and Tokyo and some kind of future. Right. But you're there on the ground and you're seeing all these giant billboards, animated billboards. It's raining. You're having the little cars drive by. The two guys are running around and you're following them. And then, you're, you know, you're scanning different people's scanning everybody in the environment. This is not like some little rinky dink two minute thing that is over like that. And you're going to forget about it right away. This is actually a pretty decent experience. I highly recommend anybody with an Oculus Rift should definitely download this. And with your vibe, you should try it through revive. I'm sure it would work good. But that is um, Blade Runner 2049 Memory Lab by Magnopus. Pretty cool. Why don't we go ahead and start into the games? Uh, Joe, you want to go ahead and start it off with uh, whatever game you've been playing? So I've been, excuse me. <clears throat> so I've been playing a game called Prison Boss. I cannot think of the developer's name at the moment. Um, full disclosure, I did get a key for it. So I know you guys do that, so I know it's best to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, but basically, um, obviously, you're in prison. It's like a crafting simulator, except you, you're pretty much crafting things like cigarettes and like what they call dirty magazines, even though it's really just like scribbles on a piece of paper. But you need to buy from like other inmates. You need to buy like all your um, your tools and you like, you know, tobacco and paper and actually notebook paper. And like, you actually have to like roll cigarettes. So like with your thumbs on the on the trackpad, which is just so cool. And you have to do your best to not get caught by the by the guards that are walking by. So like when they're walking by, you can kind of see them out of the corner of your eye and you're just like scrambling to put everything away, which is just, I think is just so gosh darn fun. 
Um, another thing you can craft as well is like additional furniture for yourself, so you have more places to hide. So I don't know. I just I, I had a really good time playing it. I don't know if like have you guys ever tr- uh, had a chance to try it before? Or? I haven't played it, but I've seen it a lot. Like I know it's a popular game, and we there's only so much time in the day, and we we don't always get to every you know title that, that people like. Uh, but but I know that it's a very popular title, and I went ahead and looked it up. Uh, the developer is Trebuchet, um, and they uh, the game is 19.99, but on sale 20 percent off for Halloween in November 1st. So you'll be able to get this by the time you hear this episode uh, for 15.99. So again, um, you know, Joe talked about it. So it seems to be a good game. I know, but I, I haven't seen anybody who's played it say anything bad about it. And I've you seen know some what videos I... of it. I, I I should get to it someday. It's just it's just time. I have to. I have so many games, and and thankfully, you know, we do get a lot of them free, and we we pay for others, and it's it's a it's a good and you know, it sounds like you know uh, a first world problem i guess yep. what you say it's like i have so many games to play like i can't play all the good ones and that so wasn't the case like this time last year it was like a good game come out and we would be like all over it and, and it would be like planning you know weeks going into that good game uh that major game coming out now they're just coming at us like the month of october was just brutal like i haven't been able to finish artica i legitimately like artica it's a little underwhelming but i i I haven't even gone back into it since we talked about it two weeks ago because i have so much other stuff to play so that's kind of what happened to me with prison boss like it's something that that if it had came out in june or something i would have probably played it a lot Hey, one quick question about Prison Boss, because one of the things I've always thought for a VR, you know, with room scale, right? Like, what is a tiny little room scale space that you can make an experience? And I thought, oh, if you were in a prison cell and you have to, like, do does it use room scale in that way? Yes, it does. Ooh, oh, awesome. Yes, does. Yeah, that makes me a lot does. more interested in it. <laughs> me too. <wow. laughs> yeah, you should definitely check it out. I liked it. Okay, Chris, do you want to get in something into something? I, I guess, yeah, sure. Um, I think probably Steve knows a little bit more about this game than me. Played it a little bit longer, and I know you have. Um, Organ Quarter uh, is like a horror game where there's like organs everywhere, not actual p- piano type things, but like human <laughs> body organs. Um, I mean, I don't know why I play these games. I hate horror games. I get scared so easily. I scream all the time. Like I'm just the worst at playing VR horror games, but. Um, yeah, it's. I mean, it's a little quirky. Like I, I, we Steve and I talked about it a little bit before the show. Like the mechanics are a little iffy, but I'd really like the map mechanics. So you kind of have this map that you can bring up, and you have stamps. So you can like stamp where you've been, what doors are locked, things like that. Um, that was a really cool mechanic. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I don't really know that much about the story or anything. Um, Steve, do you know anything about that? Well, no, I don't know really what's going on exactly. Yeah. So, you know, long story short, you're you kind of you start the game out. There's there's an opening sequence. uh, But when you like really get control, uh, you're in your apartment and your apartment is inside this large, very large apartment building. Uh, You start out on the seventh floor, to be exact. So uh, there's at least seven floors. Um, And it's it's just. We, well, we talked about the, they had an alpha demo uh, that we talked about, I believe two episodes ago, maybe three. And a lot of it carries over. It feels a lot like that that demo does. It's probably a little, performs a little better, probably a little, a little bit cleaner around the edges. But it's a very, it's like, I've never had a game that, that like made me felt it looked so bad, but also looked good at the same time. Like, and I think maybe I said that when we talked about the demo, but it's, it's all like, ps1 almost like more like nintendo 64 era like textures like it's just the textures are really bad but uh, at least on my 1080 ti like all of the aliasing like all the like the edges are all like razor sharp this is very much in focus no blurring effects no you know additional like lens flare type like like uh, graphics that just take up resources and like, so it's really clean and sharp, but at the same time, the textures are, are really just kind of old school. Uh, and, and we described it last time. We, we, we described it as sort of like VR's silent Hill. Uh, it's very much fits that mood. It's, it's demonic feeling like, like you're in some sort of like, uh, not the traditional thought of hell. Everyone thinks of hell as just like this burning inferno. Uh, you know, I guess more in recent history, people think of hell as sort of like this place that almost looks like reality, but it's just really twisted and distorted. And that's that's how this this feels. It's 
it's just it's just really bizarre. Uh, so I really like the game. The, the gameplay itself is uh, it's first person. Uh, it has smooth uh, walking locomotion with a thumbstick. Uh, everything's motion controlled. You have a flashlight. You get a pistol. You get a shotgun. Uh, Chris, you already mentioned the map mechanic. Like when you're in very beginning, when you're in your apartment, uh, as you leave your apartment door, you get a map, and it is very unique. It's it's like a map in in any game in this genre that you played in the past, whether it be the Silent Hills or the Resident Evils. Woot woot. Um, the the map is there, but but the what makes this unique, and, and I guess because you have the motion controls, is the stamping mechanic. So you have all these stamps that you can choose, and there are some preset icons that you know for locked doors and whatever you know images icons that you want, and you can stamp them anywhere on the map. So you kind of create, you chart your own uh, experience as opposed to like the Silent Hill games. They would chart it for you. You'd go up to a door and find it locked, and once you did it the first time, the Silent Hill game would automatically like mark it with a red line. Or whatever to show you that the door was locked. Uh, so I, I think I think it's it's a it's a good game. Uh, I've, I'm about an hour into it. I've gone down to the level below the level that you started on. Uh, I've gotten the shotgun. Uh, I've I've fought probably four different enemy types, and it's it's very easy in the beginning. But like I felt like it was a pretty quick. Uh, uptick in difficulty like i got to this one part and all of a sudden there were a lot more enemies and they were placed in in locations like um there are some enemies that are sort of stuck to the ceiling and and you turn around a corner and it's just right there whacking you in the head like you know you don't see it coming so so they've actually the developer has has taken time to actually strategically place uh the the some of the enemies and everything so it's it's very hard to say because the game is is good, but it also looks like it, it looks like it's amateur at the same time. Like it's you good, know what though? but it's amateur. I'll say that because I, I I actually played this for an hour earlier today, and I I love this game, man. There it's oozing with that atmosphere. Steve was talking about how. You know, the this idea of hell and, and not being the hell with like fire everywhere and demons everywhere, but like a reality that is a hell. And that's really what they conveyed with it. It reminds me of that movie Jacob's Ladder. Do you guys remember that movie Jacob's Ladder where it's like this weird reality that this guy is in, but he's still in reality, but it's like blur. It's like just a dreary, drab, horrible, depressing, oppressive atmosphere. And that's what this apartment complex that's what I feel. The music is perfect. Oh, my God. The music. It's not like Academy Award winning composer or anything, but it just fits the mood. Absolutely perfect. Like this weird little music that's in the background. And you go into some of the different apartments. The music changes and it's kind of more of like, oh, I can kind of be at ease. And then you go into other apartments. The music is more tense and, you know, oh, shit, something's about to happen. The worst part of this game, this game really falls apart when it comes to the combat. Like, the combat is bad. It's just bad. Like, the interaction of shooting one of the bat, one of the uh, creatures, just your bullets hitting it, the, I don't know, there's just something about, like, the combat is not very good. Like, Killing Floor, way better combat. Similar kind of game, way better combat, in my opinion. But the creatures are pretty cool, and and when the creatures die, they stay there. They stay on the ground, and they're occupying space, and it's kind of creepy when you walk by and you see their dead bodies there, and they stay there. But I don't know, man. There's something really cool about Oregon Quarter. It's, it's really a shame that the combat is so lackluster because other than that, man, the vibe that it's bringing, like when you go to your balcony of your apartment and you're looking out, and you see the rest of the the city, but it's so drab and dreary, and the music is just plain. And I, I know some people don't like games like this because it'll actually make them depressed. I kind of like games like this, though, because it's just so unique how they can make you feel a completely different way just by surrounding you in this environment. But um, anyway, that's Oregon Quarter. It's a new one that came out recently. Who wants to go next? I will. I um, I'm gonna really switch gears <laughs> here. Uh, so uh, I'm a big fan of Final Fantasy, and later this year we have the Final Fantasy Monsters of the Deep fishing game. And honestly, I've never played a fishing game in VR. It always kind of felt like um, you know, with motion controls, that it, it would be this 
it would, it would work well. And I know earlier this summer, Crazy Fishing uh, was released on Steam, but I never gave it a go. But this week, a, uh, a title for PlayStation VR released. It was uh, Fishing Master. I believe it's called Fishing Masters. I'm not sure if it's a, a plural there or not. Uh, but they have a demo. And this demo is very deep. Like it, it takes you through the whole tutorial. And then as far as like, I, I turned it off after maybe 35, 40 minutes and I still wasn't done with the demo. So like, this is a, this is a legit demo, like maybe too much of a demo. If people don't need to buy the game, but, um, it's a fishing game. There's not much to say in in that regard. It's not accurate. It's arcadey fishing, I should say. It's not it's not accurate to fishing, and and I haven't really fished since I was a kid. I used to fish a lot growing up. Um, so like, there's really no like the the arc in which you can cast your your lure is is very limited. Like I can't cast this way to the side, like a full 180 or anything. Um, so it's it's very limited. The mechanics are simple, but it it works. So you cast your lure. And you you wait, and you don't have to wait long for a fish to bite. So that that's very good. Uh, once a fish bites, it sort of becomes this very arcadey uh, mechanic in which you have to um, sort of like real fishing. If the if the fish is swimming off to your left, then you gotta kind of tilt your rod to the right and kind of fight against it. And and as you do that, the fish loses uh, HP. It almost becomes a little bit like a turn-based strategy in that sense. HP starts draining. Uh, and then, you know, of course, the fish will swim different directions. So, so you're swinging back and forth trying to keep track of that. And then too much tension can build up on uh, the line turns red and you have to, you know, let go so that you don't break the line and, and lose the fish. And then the fish jump and there's there's mechanics for, for all sorts of, of, of things that the fish does. But ultimately you drain its HP and, and when its HP is drained, you can lure, you can reel it in. Uh, and then it'll recover and then you do it again. So after two or three, you know, times of draining its HP, so to speak, you'll get it in the boat and then it gets weighed and there's challenges, there's money paid. You can buy new lures, you can buy new rods and reels. Um, you can buy soda, which they have that locked in the demo and they don't really tell you what soda does, but apparently you can drink soda as the fisherman. Uh, so anyways, like I just... It's it's not the most amazing thing I've ever played, but it, it was fun. Like it was a, a different type of experience if you've ever fished before or if you're an active fisherman uh, that also likes VR. I imagine there's not a big overlap of, of people that are into hunting and fishing that also are really into VR, but there's probably some out there. Um, and, you know, this this is this is not bad and it's a demo you can play it for free and the game i don't actually i didn't check uh the game i think maybe is 20 bucks so it, i don't think it would be a bad purchase if you're like really into that genre and you like you know you, like i said you like fishing uh it's 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 not a it's not a bad game at all and um you know i think it's one of those things that i think like my son like i want i want him to give it a try uh because he's i've only taken him kind of loosely fishing once or twice you know and very very like kid like fishing not not serious i'm going to get out on a boat and you know you know try to get some bass or anything like that so um yeah, it's worth checking out. Like uh, Anthony and Joe, you both should try. You both have PSVRs. I know time is what we all don't seem to have, but it's worth checking out. Sounds, Absolutely. Sounds awesome. We'll definitely have to check that out. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I'll go ahead and bring one up. So Heart of the Ember Stone, we talked about it a little bit last week, but I know a lot of us have, have played played it more this week, and we can get into that a little bit more. It's weird because, man, I'll just say that um, – there's so many things about the game that I absolutely love. And when we talk about movie-like experiences, for example, Lone Echo, Lone Echo puts you in a sci-fi movie. Like you really feel like you're in a sci-fi movie. There's times when I'm in Heart of the Ember Stone where I feel like I'm in some type of action adventure kind of movie, a fantasy action adventure. And the sound, the sound design in the game is absolutely fantastic. You, you can say anything you want about this game, but the sound design, the doors opening and closing, all the little noises. There's this one part where you know how they have that little tent and there's a radio in there. And they did this in uh, Gallery 1, too. If you grab the radio and you put it up to your ear, like it's real 3D. Like the, the 3D sound that they do in the gallery is really good. Graphics are pretty incredible for the most part. Um, the hologram stuff is done very well. Picking up the, I, I love the way you 
to, to get tips and hints, there's these books that you grab and you grab a ball and the book opens up and it's got this nice contraption. So many companies now, so many developers are doing interesting things with um, UI within the game, you know, like Lone Echo, like the stuff on your wrist, the the meters on, on wrists and stuff that people are doing. And then also opening up these guides with the books is really cool. Of course, you also have the cassette tapes that you can listen to with your little Walkman device. And again, if you move it around, the sound really, really moves around as well. Um, the problem that I get into with Heart of the Emberstone, and I'm curious if you guys encountered similar problems, is just when you get stuck. And, and this is really any VR game that has a lot of puzzles. What do you guys do when you get stuck? I'll tell you what I do. Like, I don't like looking at guides. I don't want to go look at a guide. First of all, when I'm in VR, I don't want to take my headset off because it's like when I get my headset on and I'm playing a game, I plan on playing a game for 35, 40 minutes or something like that. And if I have to take my headset off right away, that kind of pisses me off. And what I'm more likely to do is simply exit out of that game and go into some other game. And so for me, it sucks when I get stuck in a game because, I mean, I'll spend a lot of time. I try to figure it out myself. And I, I typically feel like the solution has to be somewhere here. You know, they have to make a solution where you can figure it out. But what I didn't understand with Emberstone for a while there is that you have to keep going back and forth to different locations. And so you might be in one location. You might have searched everywhere that you could possibly search for the next clue that takes you forward. But you didn't realize, oh, you got to go to the Cogs Tower. You got to go back to the original Star Seed or the, the several different locations that they have. So that kind of irritated me. But there's still a lot to love here. But why don't I go ahead and kick it over to Steve? What's your thoughts, Steve, on being stuck in VR games? How do you get around that? Yeah, like, I don't get stuck too, too often to the point where, like, I rage quit and, and whatever. Um, I will say that in VR, the games in general have been a little simpler like as opposed to um, you know flat gaming when I was really into that like I would I would used to I would be sitting down in my theater playing my PlayStation and if I got stuck on something uh, or if I was being a trophy whore and was just trying to collect some trophies I would just pull out my phone pull up YouTube or whatever and like it was all right there it wasn't that inconvenient uh, now in VR like you say like it's a problem you can't a, are you the type of person that wants to go look something up? And and if you are, how do you do that? Like, it's it's just not like even in Steam VR where you have that desktop view, it's still not really like a good way to do it. Like to go to like to pull up YouTube, for example, and then try to like type in your search. And so there's really no good way to do it. So I think developers have been a little more sensitive to that and have tried to make games that aren't so... Um, that are likely to trip people up that will make them want to go look up a a, a walkthrough or something. That said, uh, there have been some that, that really haven't followed that rule. Wilson's Heart was probably the most, and it was the only game that I played that actually caused me to like stop because I couldn't figure something out and go look look up. And and it was a little frustrating, even though I really liked that game. It's one of my favorite games of the year, honestly. Um, there was this one part that that I knew, like, I knew what I needed to do. And it, it's when the uh, wooden guy is, is coming at you. I knew what I needed to do. And I knew that it was some stupid mechanic. Like, there's a difference in a difficult puzzle and then being stuck because it's a stupid mechanic or some stupid, like, like thing like, that you didn't, for whatever reasons, like, you know, like I always wonder, did the game glitch on me? Like, do I not have the item that I need or, or did I not trigger some cut scene or, or something when I should have, like, you know, is the game glitching or is it a stupid mechanic? Um, a game like static where it was just, you know, portions of it were, was legitimately, you know, challenging. Like that didn't bother me at all. At no point did I look at a walkthrough. Uh, at no point did I, you know, really feel frustrated. In in Wilson's Heart, the example I mentioned, well, all I needed to do was at the right time turn left to see uh, uh, my silhouette of Wilson, where the, where I could teleport away from the from the wooden dummy guy. Um, so. It's, it's an issue, I, I guess. I, I don't know how they get around it. Like, you know, it, it's games are always going to have 
you know, design issues, or there's always going to be glitches, there's always going to be something. And in VR, it's not easy. Hopefully with Oculus Dash, you know, we'll, we'll be able to go and look up a guide or something without leaving VR and without having that that frustration. So, so I feel you. Uh, but about Emberstone, Heart of the Emberstone itself, uh, I really still like this game. Uh, I, the production values are out the wazoo. Uh, the, t- the transportation mechanic, um, although somewhat repetitive, I still enjoy it every time because it's, uh, and I won't spoil it still, uh, maybe one day we will, uh, but that transportation mechanic, it's it's repetitive, uh, but it's so well done and it's so short, you're maybe in it for only 30 seconds or so. It's so well done that it's, it's impressive. Like I just love the sense of scale and everything that it gives you. Uh, all in all, it's a, it's, a, it's a good game. The puzzles aren't too hard, uh, but, but like you said, and I know what you were stuck on, Anthony, is that they don't really tell you it's 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 sort of like an open world game in the sense that you you have to to know to go to these other locations like you're in the middle of solving a puzzle right and you think you have everything you need sort of in your local vicinity to solve the puzzle and no you like you have to actually backtrack Hmm. go to another location and do something and then come back and and that's my one knock on the game not so much that you have to 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 move around that that's fine uh but so far and i feel like i'm probably two and a half ish hours in um i I feel like I've done a lot of backtracking between Queen's Palace and the Tower of Cogs or Cog Tower or whatever they call it. Like I've backtracked between those two locations like two or three times now and it hasn't opened up any new locations. Now I've gone deeper in the Queen's Palace. So so there is more to see in these locations. But as of right now, like on that map, when you when you go to to uh, transport um there's only the three locations that, that you have right from the very beginning. Like nothing else, no new lo- locations have opened up. And it looks to me like the way they did that, like that, you know, there's prime opportunity for more locations to reveal themselves. And so far, none have. And that's the one kind of ding I'll give this game. It's kind of bumming me out a little bit. Very little bit. It's still a great game. Like I'm, I'm really nitpicking here, but that, that's kind of natural when a game does so much right like you're going to nitpick you know you can't just give something glowing positive remarks and not ever say anything that it does wrong so so still um, i really recommend the gallery episode too it's great but it's not without you know, its flaws. i was just going to say one thing i should mention real quick that they do do in this game that i didn't realize it until later but if you quit out of your game and then you and then you fire up ember stone again and you load up the game usually your sister will say something while the loading is going on. And what she says is a huge tip on where to go. And I started paying attention to that now, and now I'm not getting stuck. I know she's like, because she said something about going back to Earth or something. Then I was like, okay, I need to go back, you know, go back there. Joe, you played this game. Um, what, What were your feelings on it? Like Steve, you you pretty much almost have to nitpick at it because it, they do so much right in it. I mean, I guess the locomotion, like as far as not so much the teleportation, but just the actual locomotion, it's a little slow, but it's not that big of a deal. Um, I mean, the graphics I'm enjoying. I enjoy the UI, like you had said. I love love it. I love making things levitate. That's probably I, I probably spent like almost a half hour just moving rocks. So. <laughs> Um, I like how you open the doors too. It's like its own little puzzle. You have to like get on your knees and actually kind of like maneuver it around too. It's just it's just a great experience. And I mean, I could definitely see why it took so long to come out with the second one. It's just I hope they don't take so long for the third one. Yeah, Chris, did you get a chance to play it some more? I haven't played it anymore yet, but I'm just curious. Like, would this this does this game benefit from me playing on a Vive or on my Rift in a smaller space? Should I have like a room scale space? You guys think? I think you should because you know what? I've been playing this on my Rift and the one thing that does irritate the hell out of me and maybe I need to redo like my guardian boundaries or whatever. But what I love to do, okay, and this is in Ember Stone. It's in Talos Principle. It's in Oregon Quarter. I like having my arms like in my view. Like, I don't know. Do you guys ever do that where like you get both of your hands kind of in your actual view? Because then if you see your hands moving and you're in a place, 
it tricks your brain and your immersion like doubles. I'm telling you, immersion will double if you get your hands up there. And the thing I noticed with Emberstone is every time I start sticking my hands out, immediately my guardian starts showing up. And I'm like, yeah. ah, come on. And so I'm, now I'm doing like this, like trying to do uh, it's, T-Rex arms. Is that because you've moved around in your space? Like I don't know. I, I don't can know stand out is. in mine and you got a much bigger space. Did you I, ever I get think the fourth I re- sensor? need to renew, redo my boundaries. Oh, or just turn it off. Like, you know, you got a long way to go for you hit a wall. <laughs> <laughs> so like, like, no, I don't do that. Like, um, I, I try to be completely natural. Like, like if, if I walked around like this, it would actually be immersion breaking for me because I don't walk around like that in real life. Like, um, I don't, I don't you know, I just, <laughs> I like, do. Like you're driving one of those big, uh, big uh, high-handled choppers, like, <laughs> <laughs> like right off of Sons of Anarchy, like up here. Um, no, so so I in, in VR, I try to be completely like natural, and to the extent that I can, do everything that I would in the in the real world if I were there. Uh, I'd say the only thing I do that's probably not natural is is the way you look around. Like in real life, you'll use your eyes more, you know. Whereas in in VR, we tend to have like almost like broken necks where you know to turn we're you know we're, we're moving like robots because you know the way the fove and everything works um so that's really about the only thing unnatural that i do you know one other thing to say about ember stone is just man all the little special effects that they did in this game too like just that elevator that you take you know that one level where you just go up one you're just going up a tiny thing right but just that elevator you open it up and it's like and then it goes up just production value is really really good in emberstone absolutely um okay so any other games anybody wanted to bring up uh i wanted to talk a little bit about i expect you to die i picked this up uh on the big sony sale that we had two weeks ago or whatever it was and um, you know, it's a game we never talked about. It's kind of like Prison Boss. Well, here on VR Roundtable, we just never got to it, and we recognized that it was a it was a popular game. Uh, so they had some recent DLC, and that's really why I decided to play it because, like, oh, you know, I can talk about the DLC that came out this week. Except, I guess you have to complete the game before you can get to the DLC. So I didn't actually play the DLC, but the game as a whole, just for anyone that maybe hasn't played it and wants our my take on it, uh, it's it's a it's a puzzle, uh, almost like an escape the room, except you really don't have to escape a room. You have to escape a situation. Uh, but it's done in a sort of, uh, you know, classic Sean Connery Bond film type tone. Uh, it's, you're, you're a spy. You're from that that old, you know, it's not a modern era. It's not the Daniel Craig Bond movies. It's definitely the Sean Connery era. And it's um, the puzzles are really now it's called I Expect You to Die because it's sort of trial and error. Like like you're expected to die over and over as you sort of figure out what to do. So it doesn't hide from that fact. Like you'll figure out part of a puzzle and then a laser will just take you out. Like you're like, what the hell? Like, like how was I supposed to, you're not supposed to know it. You're supposed to fail. And then you apply that, that lesson learned to the next time. And these are all relatively short scenario. So it's, it's, they do a good job of, of avoiding that frustration of, of failing due to, what is essentially no fault of your own, uh, but you get back to that spot pretty quick. So it, it, it's not a ton of frustration there. Uh, but the puzzles are all pretty, like, they're the right amount of challenging, like just enough where it's not easy and mundane. You can just kind of like job simulator your way through it. Um, it's it's challenging enough, but not so challenging that it makes you want to rip the headset off. And like we were talking about earlier, uh, go and look up YouTube or Google or something like you, I, I'm able to complete them uh, in one setting. So it has a very static uh, type. Uh, it's a different game altogether, but it, it, in terms of how the puzzles are clever and, and well designed, it, it reminds me a lot of static in, in, in that sense only. And the static has completely different mechanisms. Uh, so I'll end the comparisons there. So uh, for 10 bucks now, I think there are only four scenarios four puzzles, so to speak, that that are with the game and now five with the free DLC. Uh, so at two dollars a puzzle. Um, if you get it for $10, I think is worth it at $20. It's a little probably on the steep end, uh, in terms of, of, of value. I, I don't know if I'd recommend it at 20 and I'm not sure if it's still on sale for 10 right now, but I paid 10 for it. And I think at $10, it's a good value. It's also one of those games that you can like bring over. Like if you're demoing VR to 
someone that's not a gamer. You know, you don't want to put them in Farpoint. You don't want to put them in, in even the gallery because it's just a deeper thing. Like you, someone can't play the gallery for 30 minutes, right? Like, so, so, um, th- I expect you to die is is where you can take someone in a demo after they've maybe demoed it two or three times. Like you put them through the, you know, whatever your your demo routine is. And I know we all have them, you know, whether it's, you know, people are still using the lab. I like think I still do like, you know, put people in longbow. Um, you know, I expect you to die can kind of be after someone has has done VR a couple times. I expect you to die can kind of be, you know, where they where, where you take them, you know, after maybe an hour or so of exposure. So, um Plays a pretty cool game. Yeah, speaking of demos, I remember there was a demo of it a really long time ago, and I played it, and I love the demos, like just the car scene when you're in the car. That's uh, the first one. Right. So, so in the demo, did it do the whole car scene? Yeah. Do you remember? I okay. think so, yeah. So, I, I mean, yeah, it sounds good. Like, I should probably look into it more because I loved that a lot, and I think at the time the full game wasn't out. It was just a demo, I think. So that's cool. I didn't even realize that there was more to that. I have a couple updates I could talk about real quick. Um, You know, the Job Simulator Infinite Overtime update came out recently. I don't know if you guys had a chance to try that. I actually did try it. And you know what it is, is basically you do the different Job Simulator jobs and you'll have customers that come in and the customer wants this or that. And then you're like, if you're the short order cook, you got to make the whatever food that they want. Or if you're at the AM PM, they want a slushy, but they want it supersized or whatever it is. Right. So what they did with this infinite overtime is there's all new like interactions with customers. And so I went into, you have to have finished the regular full version of Job Simulator before this unlocks, but there's a little switch in the very beginning. You just flick the switch and then now you're dealing with temp bot instead of job bot. And he's got like coffee stains all over his tie and he's like disheveled. He's like unorganized. It's it's definitely a different kind of a feel. It, it has that comedy and stuff. And the customers are new customers. It's funny. You know, it's just a cool game to go in again. So if you haven't tried Job Simulator in a while, you might want to try it. I just did the uh, convenience store clerk, but I actually want to try all the other jobs and just see kind of what it's like. Um, Another game I tried real quick was Space Pirate Trainer. Haven't played this in like eight or nine months, probably. Oh my God. If you guys have not played Space Pirate Trainer in a long time, absolutely get back in this game. The polish... It is so dialed in. It is so crystal clean. I mean, just everything is just butter, man. It just flows perfectly. I don't know if this has anything to do with me playing it on Oculus and because of asynchronous space warp, but I remember back in the days on my Vive, every once in a while, you would have like 20 different drones flying all around and there would be like, it would get framey. You know, it it would, it would kind of like get overwhelmed a little bit in certain scenarios. And now that I'm playing it, it is butter smooth. Everything works great. There's different drones I've never seen before, like almost boss monster drones. And it's just incredibly butter smooth. So Space Pirate Trainer, 15 bucks, I believe. And it's easily one of the very best VR games we have, especially now that it has so much polish added to it. And then the last little update I'll mention is Drunken Bar Fight. Um, They added some more bars to this. And I tried... I tried it where I got into this, you're on like a skyscraper and it's a wedding party. It's like a balcony of a skyscraper and there's a DJ and it's like everybody's at a wedding and the bride and the groom are there and you can get in fights with everybody. Like you can actually fight the bride and take your bottles and smash it over people's heads. And the thing I say about drunken bar fight is it's very similar to Gorn. It's very similar to Gorn. The problem is the collision detection is nowhere near as good as Gorn. If the collision detection was as good as Gorn or even like Thrill of the Fight, Drunken Bar Fight would be awesome. But the problem is it's like a lot of times when you're punching these different bar patrons and stuff, it's like your polygons are like going through their polygons and it just kind of feels a little janky. But they did add an update for that. I don't know if any of you guys have played any of those three, but if you have, you can comment on that. I've I've played the Space Pirate Trainer. So last week um when I was going through the Windows MR that Dell headset, uh the guys that ever that, that make Space Pirate Trainer I immersion, they sent me a Windows MR key. So uh I played the the latest 
um, well, they came out of early access, I guess they call it 1.0 now. Uh, I played that on, on the Windows MR unit and in I was probably a little focused on the tracking, you know, of of the Windows headset and in being able to play Spice Pirate Trainer. But at the same time, I, I was surprised because I haven't played the game in a while. Uh, it runs really good. Um, it, it, yeah, like you said, it's like almost like a different game now. You have all the different types of drones. Did you see the little swarm of the fast moving drones? Uh, you have have those in there. You have sort of the uh, the boss drones that that throw out all sorts of different shots. Um, the, the the weapons like I don't even, there's so many weapon options now like I can't use them all like I'm the type of person that that uh, I find a weapon I like and kind of stick with it you know oh like, I love the grenade the grenades because it's like boop you know and the grenade shoots mm-hmm. out and then you hit the trigger again and you explode the grenade I love the grenades yep um, so like kudos to those guys like they've they've stuck with it in early access now now they had an advantage that they earned that advantage it's not an advantage given to them but that even in early access it was a really good game and it wasn't broken and it ran reasonably well uh so really what they've done is they've just updated it like this could have been 1.0 could have been what they came out with last year it was still a good game it was still worth the 15 dollars, and then now they could just be on 3.0 or something like they didn't have to call this 1.0 but setting that aside like it's it's like this is a one of those games that most people should have in their in their library. There's no reason to not have Space Pirate Trainer. Yeah, it's a wave shooter. Um, there are a lot of wave shooters, but it's one of the more active ones. Uh, you have to dodge a lot. It gives you the slow time mechanic. Um, it's it's just all really well done. It's perfect for listening to music too, because like you could turn off the game music and then just have whatever music that's on your PC just play that, and it's just fun to listen to music while you're because you have all the sound effects, you know. Um, is there anything else anybody play that anybody wants to get into? Not that I can think of. Not really, no. I'll just mention real quick Talos Principle because last week I was slightly negative on the Talos Principle on our discussion here. I mean, I was just. It wasn't so much that I was negative, but I kept talking about a $40 puzzle game and it's not my genre, blah, 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 right? Well, the more that I play the Talos Principle, the more I'm falling in love with it. And it is absolutely worth 40 bucks. It's <laughs> incredible to think. <laughs> yeah, I know. I I kind of changed my mind a little bit. But it no, it really is. It's worth the 40 bucks. It's almost too much it's it's almost too much there's too much really because like i made it to the hall where you can go to all the different levels that the beginning part of it and i'm checking out level three and level four and level five and level six and i'm like oh my god and so many of these levels you you get to a point where you get one of these puzzles that really does make you feel like a dumbass and you're like god i know there's a way around this what do i do what do i do but when you solve a puzzle and you get your little uh tetris piece and you grab it and it makes that little jingly noise and then it shows up on your on your uh robot hand thing as another puzzle that you got it feels so good you just you feel such a sense sense of accomplishment and it's a masterful game. If you guys want Portal in VR, Talos Principle. This is Portal. I mean, for it's very, very similar to Portal. And there's a lot to love here. And so I'm what, what if I told you so you that main hall? And as you've seen at the end of that main hall, there's something that you unlock and you go even somewhere else. So that overwhelming feeling, I'm not trying to be spoilery here. No, I but did. that, that I, I, overwhelming I feeling that you have no not in those doors level one two three four five six seven whatever but no, no there's no, the, the hallway at the at the end yeah i was able and to then unlock. you go up yeah i've seen a different a completely different environment and i know that there's like 20 hours in this game this game is it's almost like they could have broken this game into pieces and just you bought like a small section of it yeah the game like i don't know how far it goes after that but uh, there's plenty of play time here, which is kind of counter to the to what you know we were talking about earlier. Like we all don't have a ton of time because we we play all these other games and review them and, and, and whatever and talk about them. So it's like a game like that's hard for it's going to be hard for me to get through. Like totally think it's awesome. The value proposition is through the roof here for the amount of content that you get. But will I get to the end of Talos Principle? I don't know. I won't. I can tell you I won't. <laughs> but I'm already I've already had so much fun with it that 
And it, it's one of those games where you could buy Talus Principle, and this could hold you over for like three months. I mean, you could literally be oh. in this thing for like three months. Yep. So, so, so yeah, guys, guys are saying now we have not only do we have new games, we have old games we have to see because there's updates all the time. This is insane. It's too much. Yeah, it is. The updates, well, see, the thing about early access, though, I've always kind of had this view of early access that a lot of developers kind of hide behind early access as a defense mechanism. But I keep getting proven wrong, you know, because these games keep improving, especially Space Pirate Trainer. I mean, it's it really is like a new game. There's all these new modes and stuff when you get into it. But anyway, guys, I guess that's going to pretty much wrap it up for episode 59 of VR Roundtable. Once again, we'll ask everybody, please subscribe to the YouTube channel. Please go ahead and smash that like button. I know that is the most cringeworthy statement of all time. Smash that it. like button. <laughs> smash it, baby. Just smash it. And uh, what else do we need you guys to do? Leave comments. We love your comments. We check out all the comments. We try to actually come in and comment on your comments. So, you know, definitely go ahead and do that. If you guys want, you can follow me on Twitter, which is at Tech Ninja, or same thing with uh, Skype and YouTube, slash Tech Ninja, T-E-C-H-N-I-N-J-O-E. Awesome. All righty. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so that pretty much does it for episode 59, and we will see you guys next week. Take see it ya. easy. Later. Bye.